So Mark here from Rock and Load. This morning, I am joined by bluesman Walter Trout. The uh, gentleman has just released his latest and 30th studio album, Ride, courtesy of Provogue Mascot Label Group. Walter, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, man. I'm still alive. Every day is a bonus. Feel Tick, good. Ticking a box there, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we recently had you in the UK, obviously, um, back in June. Mm-hmm. Yeah, doing a tour with uh, Els Bailey and Molly Marriott, I believe, uh, were, were supporting you on that tour. And you've just recently dropped then your, your 30th studio album. Can you believe, Walter, that you are where you are at this stage, 30 albums in, <laughs> five ja- five decades of, of doing what you do? Uh, no, to be honest. I, it doesn't seem that long ago that I was um, stumbling around Huntington Beach, California, wondering why I couldn't get a record deal. Yeah. You know, and now here's number 30. It um it's all kind of a blur, but I'm I'm very, very grateful and happy to be here. Yeah, it must be a blur. Like it, it must be hard to pinpoint things. At, there's got to be some obviously fantastic memories, but over a career as as lengthy as your own, with so many uh, magical events, I'm sure that you've you've shared in. It must be a bit of a blur when you when you try and pinpoint uh, when things happened. It, yeah, it does. Especially you know, I uh, grew up in the '60s and partook in a lot of uh, you know. <laughs> altering substances and so you know my my memory cells don't work all that well anymore but i i'm 71 and i'm pretty healthy i feel great and uh, i feel still a lot of energy and creative and um but yeah uh, the uh i think now i've been at this for 53 years so it is a bit of a blur, yeah. Yeah, it's strange. I was just thinking about it before the interview. I, I'm probably, I'm turning, I turned 50 in a year and a half. So you've been doing this the same length of time that I've been on the planet. And it's it's Longer. hard to ra- hard to wrap my head around um, what yeah. it must be like, obviously, because you've been honing your, honing your craft then, obviously, for that length of time as well. Well, yeah. Um, I, I still try to get better. I'm very concerned with with trying to not just keep doing the same old thing, but if if I'm going to make a record, for instance, I I want to have a little bit progress from the last record. And yeah, I think I don't always achieve that when you've done 30. Um, some of them are better than others, you know, yeah. when I look back at some of them. And um, <clears throat> for instance, when when CDs became a thing, um when I started recording, it was just vinyl. And yeah. and with vinyl, you get about 20 minutes per side. So you've got 40 minutes of music, approximately. Then CDs came out, and you could get 75 minutes on a CD when they first came out. So I'm, well, I'll just fill it up, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, I was doing these CDs that, that were basically endless. And uh, some of the tunes, when I look back, oh, I could have left that thing off, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose it must be, um, it's hard to be, is, is, it, is it hard to be self-critical and maybe stand back and analyze, or do you need other people to help you sort of make those decisions? Well, this is the thing. Let me give you an example. Um, I've read 15 reviews of my new album. Every person has a different song that they think is the best song on the album. Yeah. And there's one or two songs on the album that I won't name (laughs) that I wasn't even (laughs) sure if I was going to put the song on there because I wasn't sure if it was up to the level of the other songs. And this guy writes, that's the best song on the album. Yeah. And um, so you can't try to please other people. You know, I used to have these critics come and say, oh, well, you play too many notes on the guitar. You need to change your guitar playing. And I'm like, well, that's for this guy. This other guy down here likes the way I play the guitar. Yeah. Do do you when you're trying to be a creative artist in the long run, you have to please yourself and you have to be able to look in the mirror and say, 
I gave them the best I have. And yeah. I gave them something that for me is honest and and is authentic to how I feel and what it is I want to say. And they can either like it or not like it. But if you can look in the mirror and say, that's the best work I have. You can't worry about critics. Yeah, you just yeah, can't yeah. do it. I suppose any any album really is like a snapshot in time of where you are as an artist, isn't it? And, you know, you only have, as you say, 40 minutes or 50 minutes to maybe express that across a, an album. Yeah. I mean, I always look at an album as kind of a like when you were in school and you got, at least in America, we called it a report card. Yeah. Every couple of months, you send it home to your parents and you get an A or a B or a C. And to me, every album is sort of a report card. This is where I'm at right now, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and the process of either songwriting or recording albums, has that changed dramatically for you over the years? Let's say with, for example, the recording process with technology changing so much? Well, you... the recording process, I actually find it easier now with with pro tools and with stuff like that yeah because um it used to be back when i first started and it was all done on on tape you know if um like i remember i worked with the incredible grammy winning producer jim gaines who's produced santana and huey lewis and van morrison and he's got a room full of grammys but I made a couple albums with him in Memphis and he'd say, you know, I think we need to edit this song. And he'd sit down with the tape and he'd have a razor blade and he'd be cutting pieces out of the tape and stuff. And, yeah. and I'd be like, my God, if he's a thousandth of an inch off, the, yeah. the, the timing's going to, he always nailed it. Right. Cause he's a professional, but now if you know if they want to edit the song they go in the computer and it's done in about a, you know 2 seconds yeah um, or if if you decide you want to overdub a solo you or you want to change something in the middle of a vocal i just find that it's much easier now yeah. and, and much less time consuming yeah. A lot of the stuff in the old days with the tape was very time consuming, you know. I can only imagine like a, the the kids of today really don't understand the struggles of the musicians from years gone by, what they had to go through. Yeah, and it really really the majority of it had to be done live. Yeah. You know, and now you can take your time and you can develop something, you can build on it, you know. Yeah. Um, but with that in mind, if you listen to some old records that were done that way, they can be pretty amazing. Um, you know, yeah, pretty amazing when you think of how how they were recorded. Yeah. And you touched on it there, the the, the fact that, for example, um, live performance and live recordings. So as a musician, you really had to be on your A game to drop a drop a song in a studio. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are some bands like when you read about the Beatles, there were times they would do like 28 takes of a song. Yeah. And I just couldn't do that. <laughs> you know, something like uh, I'm good. You know, I do like to record live with my band. We have the songs together when we go in, we rehearse them. And we play them live, and and the majority of what you're hearing is done live. But I might come back and add an acoustic rhythm guitar, or add a vocal harmony, or something. But um, it it's still, uh, you know, it's it's a process. It's a process. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And so the 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 latest album then. Did you try anything different or approach it any differently at all, either through the songwriting process or the recording? Um, well, the songwriting process, I, I basically don't have a process for, <laughs> for songwriting. I, it's very hit and miss. Um, people say to me, what came first, the music or the lyrics? And I go, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Ride, the title track, when I was home writing, I was looking through some papers of mine 
And I found a poem I had written about a house I lived in when I was a little kid and what was happening there and how it was across the street from the railroad tracks. And the first line of the poem was, I lived next to the railroad and I could hear the train go rolling by. It shook the house, it shook the bed, it always made my spirit fly. And I looked at that and I thought, I can do something with that. And um, I ended up writing lyrically the whole thing. And I had no idea if it was gonna be a ballad, if it was going to be a rock tune. And then one night I was sitting around in the house playing the guitar and that the guitar lick that starts the song. Hey, this lick is pretty good. And I realized the lyrics fit in there perfectly, That, but there was no process to it. Yeah. Um, other times, um, um, let me think, uh, Ghosts. I actually had the music to that because it, it's kind of this cool guitar lick with this funky bass line under it. And I had the music and um, I was just sitting around kind of jamming. And then the lyrics just came to me, you know. They're, yeah. I, it, it's John Lennon said songwriting is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And he, he nailed it with that statement. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's different for every every musician and every band approaches it slightly differently. And mm -hmm. there's probably no really right or wrong process. It's as you say, being a creative, it's an art artistic expression and what flows flows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And tell me um a little bit about, for example, um uh, your gear that you use. Um I'm I'm assuming because you're old school, you're not surrounded by thousands of pedals or digital racks. I don't have any pedals. Not, not I, at all. I plug into a Mesa Boogie amplifier and I turn it up and I play my Stratocaster. Yeah. And um, I've been with Mesa Boogie since I was with John Mayall. So I've been with them probably 38 years. Yeah. And um, I have a lot of boogie amps. My garage looks like a boogie outlet. You know, a lot of times they make a new amp and they send one to me, say, here, try this, you know. Yeah. And um, so I had a couple different boogies in the studio, but I had an old vintage Mark one, one of their first ones. I had a Mark four and I had a Mark five. Yeah. And everything on this album is one of those amplifiers. And a lot of it had to do with, um, I may play a solo on a song. For example, the song, um, So Many Sad Goodbyes. Um, I did a solo on the Mark I, and we thought it needed a little more overdrive. And the Mark IV has got more overdrive yeah. than the one. So I use that. Um, the, the ballad, um, Follow You Back Home, I use the Mark one, but I set it on the clean channel. Um, everything. I, I don't use any pedals, man. I, I yeah. don't know what to do with them. <laughs> it's funny. Cause I was going to ask in, uh, about the, the, the whole, obviously guitars chase tone all the time, but obviously you found your tone many years ago and you've settled on it then with the, with the Mesa and you've just been, been, uh, 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 well, what's the word? Loyal to it. Loyal to that sound. Well, it's it's me. I'll give you an example. I have a dear friend whose name is Robin Ford. You've probably yeah, heard. Yeah, him. stellar he player. Has, yeah. He has the original Dumble amplifier. Yeah. And Dumble amps are the holy grail of guitar amps. Robin has like number zero zero one. And it's been named as the most valuable vintage amp on the planet. It's worth probably a quarter of a million dollars. And I did a bunch of shows with him. And I said, I really like the sound of that amp. And he said, well, get yourself a Dumble. And I'm like, well, they're the cheapest you can get it online. I'd have to sell my house. And he told me, well, there's companies that build clones. Yeah. So I went to a company that I shall not name. I talked to them. <laughs> they built me a clone of a Dumble. It cost me a whole lot of money. I used it for three gigs. I spent all night turning around, turning dials, hitting switches. Finally, 
I said to my guitar tech, would you just go get me my boogie and set it up? Yeah. He brought the boogie up on the stage. I plugged in. I went, okay, I'm home. I know what I'm doing here. And I sold that. Um, I sold my Dumble clone to a very well-known guitar player who will be not named. <laughs> but lately I saw him and I said, I've been watching videos of you and I've never seen that amp. And he told, he goes, well, I tried using it and I spent all night turning dials and hitting switches. And I said, yeah, it's, it's fucking complicated, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, I plug into the boogie. I set the tone. I set the reverb. I set the gain. Off I go. Yeah. It's about a cons consistency, isn't it? The most versatile guitar amps on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had the pleasure of trying one. Um, I don't even think there's a retailer locally to me that stocks them, unfortunately. But uh, I know people rave about them. And equally, the people, some people will say that they're um, like Marmite for some people, you know, because they are a little bit tricky maybe to dial in. But once you do dial them in, they can be fantastic amps to use. Well, it's, you know... I, a lot of, in quotes, blues guys don't like boogies because they do have a lot of gain. Yeah. But I want a lot of gain. Yeah. The the metaphor I use is I want my guitar to sound like Little Richard, not Michael Bublé. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An animal, I suppose. Yeah. I yeah. want it to go. <laughs> I want to hold a note for 45 minutes, you know. And tell me about guitars then. So um, do you have a big collection of guitars or you, do you have a small collection that you tend to rotate? I, I'm not a, a guitar collector. To mm. me, they're tools to use. And when I find a good one, I want to have a relationship with it. Yep. And I basically use one guitar. Um, I want to know it in and out. I, I want to have a relationship with that guitar. Um <laughs> You know, I, I got to say, I did a gig a couple of years ago before the pandemic. I did a gig with Jeff Beck. And he had one Strat. One. He didn't even have a spare. <laughs> and I'm in the I'm in the guitar booth with his guitar tech, right? And there's two or three basses lined up. The bass player has different bass guitars. And there's no spare. And I said to Jeff's guitar tech, he doesn't even have a spare here. And he goes, no, he likes that. I said, what do you do if he breaks a string? And the guy says, with that drummer and that bass player, drum solo, and that while he's doing that, I change the string. Yeah. You know, normally, if you break a string, you use the spare guitar, yeah. right? Not Jeff. He's got one guitar. And I got to say, I admire that, and I understand it. Yeah. Yeah, and so but what, what... each his own, you know. I just did. I just yesterday got back from the Mediterranean cruise with my friend Joe Bonamassa, and he had a lot of guitars. But yeah. that's how he likes to do it, you know. Yeah, I, I would okay. dread to think how many guitars Joe has at the stage. I I don't know. <laughs> I know he's got sixteen doubles. Does he? My God, God, yeah. yeah. He's he's definitely a, a different breed. Yeah, and it's to me, I. I just think of them as tools. I have an acoustic I love to play that my wife bought me for my birthday some years ago. I use that on the record. Um, I have a Martin guitar acoustic that I bought in 1965. I still love that. Um, I have a few strats. I have a couple of tellies. Um, I have one Les Paul that never gets used. Um, but I'm just a Strat guy. Yeah. And so what, what is the Strat that you tend to go to? Well, the one that I use now on the road, uh, it, on the cover of most of my albums, you see that old beat up yellow Stratocaster of mine. And that was my number one for years and years and years. But I retired it from the road for two reasons. First off, it's incredibly heavy and it destroyed my left shoulder. Second off, after I used it for like 40 years, um, I got really nervous having it on the road that it was going to get stolen. 
Yeah. And, and I want to leave it to my kids, you know? And so, um, a guitar builder in San Diego, after my shoulder went out, a guitar builder named Scott Lentz built me a body, very, very light guitar body. I took a neck off one of my other strats that I loved the neck and Seymour Duncan, the great Seymour Duncan built me a set of pickups. And um, that's what I've been using now. That's what's on this record. I also use um, a Delaney, uh, Delaney Guitars out of Texas makes a Walter Trout signature model. And I use that on the record. That's on Waiting for the Dawn. It's, it's in the video of Waiting for the Dawn. And um, when I do this, I have a U.S. tour in September. I'll be using the Delaney exclusively. Okay. But he, he based his signature, my signature model, he based that on my old Strat. He even came to my house in California and measured the neck. And, and you know, so he based that guitar on my old Strat. And it's a beautiful guitar, the signature model. Yeah. And out of curiosity, do you know, what wood is the, the new light bodied Strat made out of? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but you could you could ask Michael Delaney, the the guitar builder. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, it's it's also incredibly light, and the Delaney sounds great. You can hear it on "Waiting for the Dawn" on the new album. Yeah, and yeah, you sort of touched on, for example, the Les Paul is a guitar that you don't really go near. You, obviously, you find your home and your your comfort zone within the Strat. Yeah. Versatility, I suppose, as well with the five way selector. It's also, let me tell you, when I started playing as a teenager, um, I bought a Les Paul because on the cover of Super Session, Michael Bloomfield had a Les Paul. So I figured that's what I better get because he was my, my guitar god, Bloomfield. So I had a Les Paul. And after the, after the Les Paul, I also got myself a 335. I was a Gibson guy. Mm. But I find that I like to play, while I'm playing, I like to change the controls all the time. I might be in the middle of a solo and decide to change pickups for one measure. Yeah. Or even on one note. I might like to hold a note, sustain it, switch the pickup, Right. So um, when I was with the Gibsons, I'm up here changing pickups, then I'm down here changing the volume, and I, I spent half my time doing this. Then I was at a jam session in 1970 in Philadelphia, and a fellow named Bill Brown walked up to me and said, why don't you try my Stratocaster? And I put it on, and I found that while I'm playing, I can control the whole guitar with my pinky. I don't even have to stop playing. It's all right there. It's such a beautiful design, and it's so easy to work. And then the body and the back of the body, it fits right against you. It's like a beautiful woman. It mm -hmm. just fits against your body, and it feels so good. And while you're playing, you can turn it up and down. You can switch the pickups. You can all right right there you know and i was like leo fender came up with the perfect design you know for a guy who likes to um be turning the volume up and down all the time and switching pickups all the time yeah. um, it, it's it's just the ultimate design of a guitar i think yeah, he, and for a, a guy who he wasn't a guitar player at all as well, wasn't he? He was just more of a, a designer he was engineer, like a radio electronic guy, really. Yeah. But he he hit on something there. Oh, absolutely! Because that design, just having all the controls of the guitar right there, where your right hand is, you yeah. don't have to come up here to switch pickups. You know, yeah. it's right there, man. You yeah. know, it's just I know and the guitar hasn't deviated too much really from that design either. You know, even with the most modern guitars, there's like headless guitars, etc. But really fundamentally the design hasn't deviated a massive amount from the likes of the strat back in the no, 50s. He he actually I think you know a lot of guys have tried to come up with 
what they think is a way of improving on it. And you can't improve on it. It's mm. perfect. It's yeah. just perfect. But that, of course, this is just my opinion. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else will have a different opinion, but my own personal preference, I think the guy created the perfect instrument. Yeah. And you just touched on, you were um, just a back from the blues cruise with Joe Bonamassa. How did that go? Oh, that went great. That went, that was so much fun. I got to jam with Joe and hang out and I got to jam and hang out with Tommy Emmanuel, who is like the greatest guitarist on the planet. Um, yeah, cr oh, cr it, criminally it, it, underknown, Tommy Emmanuel, isn't he? Criminally underknown. He's such a great guitar player. He He's jaw dropping. He's he's astounding, you know. Yeah. I mean, he comes out and does a tribute to the Beatles, and he plays all the parts. Yeah, at once. he even has a song called "I Don't Need a Band," <laughs> and he does the drums with his hand, and then he plays the bass lick, then he plays the rhythm part, then he plays the lead, and at the end, he has the whole thing going, and he's singing, "I don't need a band." He, he's incredible, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember seeing an interview with him talking years ago about the fact that when he was a young kid playing with his family band, that he didn't realize that bands actually existed with other musicians. So he, he literally played all the parts for those reasons. And that's why his, his style is so expansive. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic. Phenomenal. Amazing. Great guy. Great guy. So I, I had great fun. And my wife was there and my son, John, who's an awesome musician was there and got to play with my band and we got to have guitar duels on stage and um do some tunes together that we wrote together and very good um it was really a lot of fun and great I'm, time. I'm sure walter obviously coming out the back of the pandemic and, and losing a couple of years of our lives there um the importance of all this uh must have been driven back home for you and the appreciation for what you do Man, that's an understatement. Um, after losing it when I was ill, you know, I lost the ability to play the guitar and I had to start over again. I had to teach myself all over again from scratch. And then to get back to having a career and touring and recording and then have it all stop yeah. was, um, was pretty, pretty hard to go through. Yeah, and also sure. to say to myself, I'm getting old. I'm 71. I'm on my second liver. I don't know how long I have. I want to contribute. I want to create. I want to play to people. I want to utilize whatever talent I've been given, and I want to give it to the world. That's my calling. And here I am sitting on the couch watching Netflix, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't good. Wasn't good at all. But it's great, great to see you back out there doing your thing again. And 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 uh, the world's a better place for it for sure. Well, thanks. Yeah. I believe that that any artist, um, when they create their art and they put it out there, that they're making the world a little bit better place. Yeah. That's what art is about. Any any art. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And can I ask you, Walter, just your opinion on um, the blues as a genre today in 2022? Did you ever fear in any shape or form that maybe there may not have been people coming behind the likes of yourself to carry on the mantle? Or were you always confident that the young youth would come through? I, I've always felt that no matter how much computer music comes out there or how much corporately produced stuff the the media is going to present to you um, that there is always always going to be a place for just a human being with an instrument playing from his heart yeah cr trying to create something that reaches out to people trying to um present our common humanity in in what you do there's always going to be a place for that. I don't think that's ever going to go away. There's always going to be a place for a guy with a guitar or a piano playing and singing something from their experience, from their feeling, something they've they've been through that other people can relate to. Yeah. Um, it, it's human, man. 
and and art that kind of art has been around since the first caveman started playing the drums you know beating on a beating on a drum it it's a something that is so intrinsic to us as human beings it's never going to go away i have a great optimistic feeling about it myself yeah yeah i, I agree i agree yeah uh, i think a lot of people will be negative and like to write sensational headlines but i think there'll always be a passion for live music and a desire from individuals to create it as well yes yeah of course people yeah. to create it and then people who want to hear it and experience it yeah. and it's not live music also creates a community yeah. i was thinking when i was on that boat the other day and we were up there playing at that point it didn't matter those people we were all there together and we were a community and at that point it didn't matter who they voted for yeah know? yeah yeah absolutely and out of curiosity are there any young players that you really admire that you've sort of either worked with or uh, you listen to at all well the you know you know who toby lee is yeah Toby Lee was on the boat and I've known him since he was 10 years old and man, is he growing Yeah, and just a beautiful, beautiful musician. Um, really, I think he's got a big, big future because he, he is able to blend blazing technique with heart and soul. Yeah. He's a combination of both. There are guys out there who have great technique yeah. But I don't feel like they're saying anything. Yeah, they're yeah. like a poet who just spouts big words that have no meaning, right? Yeah. And um, I thought he did great. Now there's there's of course the whole crop in the UK, but they're not all that young <laughs> anymore. The guys <laughs> from I knew twenty years ago, the Danny Bryant and Mitch Laddie and Ian Parker and Ollie Brown and. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on. The Nimmo brothers. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole crop of brilliant young musicians in the UK. Yeah. And it's amazing, really. Yeah. And so tell me, Walter, what's on? What's next for you then on the horizon? You said a, a US tour? Well, in two days, I'm going to Norway, and I'm going to be one of the headliners at the Hell Blues Fest in Good. hell norway so yeah i'm going to hell but i've known that all my life anyway but um and after that i go to america from norway and i do a three-week tour of america then i come back over here and i do an eight-week tour of europe um and at the end of that at the end of november i go back to california and I do four shows in Los Angeles. Okay. And, um, bit, then I'm going busy to have, time for you. This it's ridiculously yeah. busy. Um, very good. After sitting on my ass for two years during the pandemic, <laughs> I'm working very hard. But I can tell you, my wife manages my career, right? And she's also in Europe. She's my booking agent. Yeah. And I'd be sitting on the couch and she would walk in and say, hey, I have an offer for a gig at, and I'd say, take it. Yeah. She'd go, yeah don't yeah. you want to know where it is? I go, I don't care. She goes, yeah. do you want to know what it pays? I don't care. Yeah. It's a gig. Just take it. And so I'm doing stuff like um, a couple of weeks ago, I played in Germany. The next day I got up and I flew to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I did Minneapolis, Duluth, and Fargo. The next day after Fargo, I flew from Fargo to Minneapolis, to New York, to Amsterdam, to Copenhagen. My wife picked me up in Copenhagen. We drove five hours into Sweden, got on a ferry boat, went to an island. I played a gig. Then we came back here and then I took off and um, where I did some gigs here in Denmark. I did a couple festivals. I mean, it's. Actually, even my band are going, hey, man, we don't know if we can do this. And I'm going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm 20 years older than you. I'm on my second liver. I'm doing it. You want it to work? I got work for you. Yeah. You're bitching, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're, absolutely. You're very welcome to go back and sit on the couch. There's a nice movie on Netflix. I'll find somebody that wants to work. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drive it home, drive it home. And tell me, Walter, I believe you moved from California to, to Denmark. What prompted that move? Well, we have a home here. My wife is a Danish citizen. I met okay. her here. Um, our three kids live here. They all go to school and work here. But when the pandemic hit and we were in California, we thought, well, we'll go to Denmark for a couple of months because our home here is in a little fishing village of 500 people on right. the North Sea. Very safe here, right? Yeah. Um, we're right on the edge of a national park, and we're like, we can go into our, our house there and look out the back door, and there's the, the North Sea, and there's only... We thought we'd be here for a couple of months. Yeah. But it turned into two years. Yeah. But I still consider that I live both places. For instance, when I go home in December to California, I'll be there through probably April or May. Okay. okay. Um, and then, I don't know, you know, but we have a house in both places. And I consider really, we're kind of um, bi-continental here, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's great, though, that you have that option because um, obviously the winters will get cold in, De in Denmark. Yeah. And get out to the go, sunshine. We go south, we're south of L.A., and in January yeah. we can sit on the front porch with the palm trees and the sunshine and walk down the street and swim in the ocean, you know. Oh, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've, got, I've got an Irish winter ahead of me, so, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Walter, I'll leave it there. Absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you for having me on your show, man. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Absolute pleasure. Um, best luck for the rest of the year and keep on doing what you're doing, man. It's great to see. Thank you very much. And take okay, care, well, okay? You too. Take care. Thanks again, Walter. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.